Hello, my friends, hello, and welcome, once again, to Stately Vaughn Manor and the Robert E. Howard Show. Yes, it's the Robert E. Howard Show. Yeah, it's the best name I could come up with. Sorry, guys. So up to now, I've been doing every Monday, pretty much, uh, Mythos Monday, where I've been talking about H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, I've been talking about H.P. Lovecraft for months, and we've gone through most of his... Uh, important to work. So I thought it was time to switch gears and start talking about my very favorite writer of all time, Robert E. Howard. Uh, Robert E. Howard, the greatest pulp writer who ever lived. That's not an opinion. That's a fact. Uh, he created, of course, Conan the Barbarian, Cole, the King of Volusia, Bran MacMorn, the Pictish King, uh, Solomon Kane, the Puritan adventurer, and a lot of other stuff besides. He wrote a lot in a short amount of time. Uh, he was born January 22nd, 1906, and passed away June 11th, 1936, at the age of 30. So all his writing was done as a young man. And he did, unfortunately, take his own life. He was, um, he, he suffered from depression, Robert E. Howard. And his death, of course, was a tremendous tragedy, uh, not, the, not the least because we have been robbed of all of the great stuff he would have written had he lived. And he was a tremendous talent. He would have written some great stuff. As it is, we have to settle for all that he did write, and fortunately, he did write quite a bit. He was a very interesting person. He spent most of his life in the small town of Cross Plains, Texas. And it is a small town. I've been there, and it is small. Uh, you get a sense of the kind of isolation he must have felt if he didn't feel like he really fit in. And he didn't feel like he really fit in. Which is unfortunate. Uh, I, I've been to his little house, which is a museum now. And I saw his tiny little bedroom where he typed his tremendous epic stories. Uh, it was a great experience. It was back in 2010 when I went there. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about Robert E. Howard himself and read a little bit from uh, a few people who knew him, about him, uh, a few memoirs of Robert E. Howard. And then I'm going to talk about uh, my plans for this exciting show and what I'm going to be talking about on Mondays and how I'm going to be going about it. Fortunately, I have this great book, This is the Last Celt, uh, which is a bio-bibliography of Robert E. Howard. Um, if you're a real Robert E. Howard fan, you're lucky if you could find this, because this is, this is a great book uh, with a few little memoirs uh, from people who knew Robert E. Howard, a very out-of-date bibliography, but it's still pretty cool. Uh, I feel it's only fair to give... H.P. Lovecraft, uh, the first reading, uh, since we are taking over from uh, Mythos Mondays. H.P. Lovecraft knew Robert E. Howard through letters. They corresponded. They were pen pals. They had great respect for each other. Uh, they recognized each other's talents. And they got to know each other fairly well through very long debating letters. Um, and so when Robert E. Howard died and H.P. Lovecraft got the news. H.P. Lovecraft was devastated. It was a tremendous blow to him, uh, both on a personal level, because he really knew Robert E. Howard by that point from his letters, but also because he recognized Robert E. Howard's talent and what the world was losing. Um, he wrote a piece called A Memoriam, and I'm going to read the little bit about Robert E. Howard's writing, uh, Lovecraft can tell you about it a lot better than I could. Beginning to write at 15, Mr. Howard placed his first story three years later while a student at Howard Payne College in Brownwood. This story, Spear and Fang, was published in Weird Tales for July 1925. Wider fame came with the appearance of the novelette Wolf's Head, in the same magazine in April 1926. In August 1928 began the tales dealing with Solomon Kane, 
an English Puritan of relentless dueling and wrong redressing practices whose adventures took him to strange and primordial cities in the African jungle. With these tales, Mr. Howard struck what proved to be one of his most effective accomplishments, the description of vast megalithic cities of the elder world, around whose dark towers and labyrinthine nether vaults linger an aura of pre-human fear and necromancy, which no other writer could duplicate. These tales also marked Mr. Howard's development of that skill and zest in depicting sanguinary conflict, which became so typical of his work. Solomon Cain, like several other heroes of the author, was conceived in boyhood, long before incorporation in any story. Always a keen student of Celtic antiquities and other phases of remote history, Mr. Howard began in 1929 with The Shadow Kingdom in the August Weird Tales, that succession of tales of the prehistoric world for which he soon grew so famous. The earlier specimens described a very distant age in man's history, when Atlantis, Lemuria, and Mu were above the waves, and when the shadows of pre-human reptile men rested upon the primal scene. Of these, the central figure was King Cull of Volusia. In Weird Tales for December 1932 appeared The Phoenix on the Sword, first of those tales of King Conan the Sumerian, which introduced a later prehistoric world, a world of perhaps 15,000 years ago, just before the first glimmerings of recorded history. The elaborate extent and accurate self-consisting with which Mr. Howard developed the world of Conan in his later stories is well known to all fantasy readers. For his own guidance, he prepared a detailed quasi-historical sketch of infinite cleverness and imaginative fertility. Meanwhile, Mr. Howard had written many tales of the early Picts and Celts, including a notable series revolving round the chieftain Bran Mac Morn. Few readers will ever forget the hideous and compelling power of that macabre masterpiece, Worms of the Earth, in Weird Tales for November 1932. Other powerful fantasies lay outside the connected series. These included the memorable serial Skull Face, and a few distinctive tales with a modern setting, such as Black Canaan, with its genuine regional background and its clutchingly compelling picture of the horror that stalks through the moss-hung, shadow-cursed, serpent-ridden swamps of the American Far South. Outside the fantasy field, Mr. Howard was surprisingly prolific and versatile. His strong interest in sports, a thing perhaps connected with his love of primitive conflict and strength, led him to create the prize-fighting hero Sailor Steve Costigan, whose adventures in distant and curious parts delighted the readers of many magazines. His novelettes of oriental warfare displayed to the utmost his mastery of romantic swashbuckling, while his increasing, increasingly frequent tales of Western life, such as the Breckenridge Elkins series, showed his growing ability and inclination to reflect the backgrounds with which he was directly familiar. So, yeah, that's a bit about his writing and the extent of his writing. He wrote a lot. He wrote a lot of different things in many different genres. For my money, uh, the best stuff that he wrote was, of course, his fantasy stories, uh, his Conan, Bran MacMorn, uh, Cull stuff. But all of his stuff was pretty compelling. Uh, he had a way of writing that could really just take you away. No one can take you away from the mundane world and suck you into his stories the way Robert E. Howard could. You really feel like once you're into his stories that you're experiencing the stories, uh, not like you're reading the stories. That's a, a, particular, a particular talent of really, really good writers, and he was one. But H.P. Lovecraft, he never met Robert E. Howard in real life. Uh, he only knew him through correspondence. There was a writer uh, named E. Hoffman Price, a pulp writer that you'll find in anthologies now and again. 
And E. Hoffman Price actually went to Texas in 1934 and met Robert E. Howard and spent some time together and got to know him. And he wrote an interesting memoir about it, and you can find it in this book, The Last Celt. Uh, and this is an interesting little part right here that kind of gives you a sense of Robert E. Howard's personality. Robert must always have felt himself to be, whether he wanted to or not, someone and something apart from the standard model Texan. This became clear within the hour of my arrival. He was taking me to the barber shop for the first haircut I'd had in many weeks. He said abruptly, Ed, I am goddamn proud to have you visit me. Direct, blunt, childlike simplicity. That was what he thought, and that was what he said. His sincerity touched me. It was awkward, for I couldn't think of anything apt, to, apt by way of begging off on the compliment. I fumbled and said, Hell, Bob, I don't see what you've got to be proud about. He answered, It's this way. Nobody thinks I amount to much. And so I am proud to show these people that a successful writer thinks enough of me to drive a thousand miles to hell and gone out of his way to visit me. As I have observed, Robert E. Howard was a man of forthright and salty and direct speech. I quote him virtually letter perfect. While getting my hair cut, I wonder what made him refer to me as a successful writer. I'd barely made groceries. Maybe it was Texas stubbornness. He'd predicted success, and regardless of fact, it was to him something in the bag. I do not know just how seriously Robert E. Howard underrated his standing in Cross Plains. I do, however, know that on the day of his death, the local paper reprinted, from a magazine, one of his last yarns. Between that 16,000-word piece and the obituary, he got more space than any citizen of Cross Plains ever got, before or after. Yet during his life, the town pondered on the pity of it, the son of a man as esteemed as Dr. I. M. Howard, fooling around writing for magazines. The following day, I had further evidence of Howard's deeply ingrained sense of being different and hence unacceptable to his fellows. I was working on an oil field story for which I wanted added details. So Howard offered to take me to a lease perhaps a mile or so from home, one of the shallow fields whose drilling technique differed from that of the Oklahoma fields. I met the engineer, a solid Pennsylvania Dutchman who cordially answered all my questions and volunteered a good bit of information in addition. All in all, I was pleased with the welcome, but on the way back to the house, Howard abruptly broke a long moan of silence by demanding, you sure he told you everything you wanted to know? Didn't hold out or cut you short? Without giving me a chance to assure him that I'd been jammed with data, he went on, I'll go back and give him hell. None of these bastards can snub my friends. Between outbursts, he was soft-spoken, conventional in his diction, with an easy and graceful courtesy, whether paying or accepting a compliment. He knew what to say and how to say it. His was typical Texas talk, and he knew his medium, salty, rugged, volcanic, colorful, shot with whimsy, and set off with phrases of scriptural simplicity. His father had that same expressiveness, and in writing me of his double bereavement, Dr. Howard's stark sentences have the impact which comes from instinctively apt expression. On the same walk, Howard was not only revealing himself, but also quizzing me, an outsider. After some moments of pondering, he asked, Ed, have you got any enemies? He expected the answer to be yes. This was plain from his tone and from my recollection of his letters and from fiction in which he had expressed himself on the post-Oak region a land of hard-working, hard-hating, hard-fighting people. A land of feuds which, even in Robert's earlier years, might well have reached the heights of the classic Hatsfield-McCoy feuding. After a pause, I answered, I don't think I have. He ended by believing me simply because he did not think I was the sort of person who would lie to him. But he could not understand, and ended by abandoning the matter. I always found that bit kind of interesting. Um, 
probably the best memoir you could find about Robert E. Howard, and it's a good one, is by Novel and Price, Ellis. Uh, this is One Who Walks, uh, One Who Walked Alone. Uh, this was made into the film, The Whole Wide World, and Novelin uh, was Robert E. Howard's close friend, and his pretty much the closest thing he ever had to a real relationship was with Novelin. Um, they had an interesting relationship, and she gives uh, a pretty interesting uh, portrait uh, of the of the man. And she first met him because she she was a writer, and he was. A successful writer. Uh, he was a published author, which was kind of a big deal. So she persistently kept trying to uh, meet him, and his mother kept putting, putting her off. But she finally got to meet him. And uh, this is a little, little piece of that here. I liked Bob Howard, and I didn't care what some people said about him. We went back into the living room and sat down. What did you want to talk to me about, he said. About writing in general, I said. I'm still trying to write stories, and I'm still getting notes and also rejection slips. He ran his fingers through his hair and smiled, but his eyes didn't seem as happy as his smile. I think everybody gets them. Some of my friends tell me they still get them after years of writing and selling. I get them myself, too. Yes, but you do sell. It was half question and half statement. He nodded. A man's got to make a living some way. The rest of the house was as still and quiet as if we were alone, but I felt that someone was listening somewhere, that if you spoke in this room, you could be heard all over the house. I looked toward the hall door and then back at Bob. He was sitting in a high-backed rocker, his arms on the chair arms. I was sitting on the divan, on the end opposite to the one where his mother had been sitting when I came in. You're still writing full time, I asked. Yeah, I was writing when you came in. Didn't you hear me? We both laughed. Do you always tell your stories as you write them? Again, he ran his fingers through his hair. A hell of a noise, wasn't it? Well, yeah, I do. I find that if I talk them out, hear the words as I put them down, the yarn goes a little smoother. Sounds better when you read it. I know what you mean, I said eagerly. The voice brings words to life. That's right, he said. You're absolutely right. And back to this selling bit. And you don't write unless you sell. I'm working on a Conan yarn now. I don't know whether it will sell or not, but I'm working on it. I figure the law of averages will give you sales if you keep pounding them out. I write slowly. It takes me more than a month to pound out one and another couple of weeks to get it tight. You'll have to learn to write faster than that. Maybe even two or three a week, depending on length. Uh, so that was a little bit about his writing uh, that he talked to Novelin about. Then they decided to go out for a drive, and this little bit is the last bit I'll read to you, I promise, uh, but it's a, it's a good part. We talked about the moonlight. It's a pretty night, I said. Beautiful, he agreed. That's a beautiful harvest moon, if I do say so myself. I laughed. I suppose you're responsible for the moon. By all means, that moon was designed especially for you. You knew I was coming? Oh, yes. I was going along with old Conan and all that bunch of crap stuff, and all of a sudden, you popped up out of the typewriter. He reached over, took one of my hands, and held it in his. Yes, sir, you popped up out of the typewriter, and I said, Now, Bob Howard, you big, ugly lummox, there's a girl who's going to appreciate your moonlight. I was amused. I think you're a poet. Well, now, you know, girl, not many women can appreciate a thing like that. Here I am, pounding out words and poems and singing to high heaven and looking up and ordering moons. And do you know anybody who can appreciate them? And me? Me, I laughed. I can. He held my hand tighter. Good. You're one in a million, girl. One in a million. We both laughed. Not because it was funny, but because life was funny. The moon was funny. The world was funny. And I laughed because I realized he would never call me by my name. To him, I'd be girl. I wondered if he referred to women like that in his stories. He talked about his character, Conan, and the scrapes he had gotten 
himself into. That was the damnedest bastard. The damnedest bastard whoever was. Conan was the damnedest bastard. A great character. So that was a little bit about Conan. Uh, excuse me, that was a little bit about Robert E. Howard uh, himself. And on future thrilling episodes, they're going to be at least as thrilling as this, I'll be talking about the different characters one at a time. Next week, I'm going to be talking about Solomon Kane, his first major character. I'll be talking about Solomon Kane, kind of an overview next week. Following that, I'm going to be talking about each one of the Solomon Kane stories in order, one after the other. And then I'm going to be, when we're done with Solomon Kane, I'll be moving on to Cull. Then I'll be moving on to Bran MacMorn. And finally, I'll be talking about Conan. After I talk about Conan, I'll be talking about the other major uh, stories that he did, those involving El Borak, his historical stories, and of course his horror stories. I'm also going to be talking about his boxing stories a little bit. I'll have one episode on that. And uh, I will also be talking about some of the fantasy stories that were outside of the Connected series. So all of those fantastic episodes are in the future. Uh, so yeah, that was the first episode of the Robert E. Howard Show. I hope you enjoyed it. Catch me next week when I talk about Solomon Kane. Okay, guys, I will catch you next time.